can get started. Recording in progress. Um, so Krista Olson is going to start off with a few words to open our public memory present tension symposium. And I'll pass it over to Professor Krista Olson. Hi, everybody. I actually need to take care of this for a second, <laughs> and then I'll be with you. Murphy's Law. There's more people coming in, so it's quite all right. I love it. Apologies. <laughs> well, welcome to the UW um, Rhetoric, Student Rhetoric Society Symposium. Uh, this is sort of the combined symposium of 2020 and 2021. Um, and thanks to everybody who's made it possible. So public memory present tensions is a fitting frame for this symposium in April of 2021. Many of us are entering this virtual space from buildings and infrastructure that is built on ancestral Ho-Chunk land uh, from the territory that they call Dejope, where the Ho-Chunk nation still exercises sovereignty and challenges the University of Wisconsin-Madison to do right by this land, its peoples, its histories, its traumas, its present. As Robert Lee and Tristan Atone and their collaborators have recently demonstrated, all of us working and learning in land grant or land grab universities owe our present places to funds taken from the sale of native land. UW Madison exists as we know it today because of the sold stolen land that was the ancestral home of the Chippewa and Menominee peoples. This memory and its present tensions are being remade public as we gather, an ongoing conversation. And this afternoon, we'll hear from Professor Dave Tell about how public memory of the murder of Emmett Till continues to act in the present, while 300 miles away in Brooklyn Center, a community mourns Dante Wright and rises up against yet another state-sponsored lynching, all in the midst of the ongoing trial of Derek Chauvin and the memory of George Floyd's murder. We live in the midst of public memory and present tensions. And we as rhetoricians, as teachers, as humans have responsibility to both that memory and to its present tensions. So as we gather over the next few days, I invite you to listen for those memories, to feel those tensions and to find yourself called into public by them. In Professor Tell and Professor Derek Handley tomorrow, we have excellent models for how to engage histories and step out into the present. Many of you also will be offering such models. I'm grateful to be in your midst. I'd also like to show our gratitude to the people who brought us together to have these conversations, to be in public together. Uh, Kelly Jensen and Amanda Pratt and your team, thank you for your work. It takes a lot to make a conference happen. It takes perhaps even more to make one happen where you have to develop a framework and a virtual context for it. Thank you for that. You've done it with such aplomb and such care. And we're all grateful, I think, for the opportunity to be together. So thank you. And I'm excited to hear what's next. Thank you so much, Krista. Um... And thank, every, thank you to everybody for coming. I know there's a great showing here today. So that's really exciting that all of our labors are kind of coming to fruition in this way. I'm Amanda Pratt. I'm in English, um, the English side of rhetoric at UW-Madison and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate. Um, and I want to first off by also thanking um, our sponsors. So the Rhetoric of Society of America uh, awarded us with a special event award for this event. Um, the Departments of English and Communication Arts at UW-Madison have provided support as well as a Baldwin, Wisconsin IDEA seed grant, uh, specific thanks to Caroline gottschalk Drushki, Sarah McKinnon, and Krista Olson for including us in their rhetoric and action proposal, which allowed us to bring Professor Tell here. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to, um, oh, actually first I'm going to really quickly share a couple of links in the chat. So there is a um, link to our access folder. And if you go to the keynote, um, keynote folder within that, there's a Google doc that has a link to 
uh, Professor Tell's materials. I hope that works, Dave. Um, and then there's also our link tree there, which is where we're kind of putting all our links that um, are relevant to the conference. So you'll see the program there, um, and all, as well as the registration link for Derek Hanley's keynote talk tomorrow afternoon, if you haven't already registered for that. Um, so also too, the live transcription should be enabled. So you might have to look at your bottom menu and enable that on your end, but it should um, be there for you. <clears throat> and without further ado, I would love to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Professor Dave Tell. Um, and so I will read from his bio, um, and this is on page five in the program. All right. Um, so Dave Tell is a professor of communication studies at the University of Kansas. He is the author of Con Confessional Crises and Cultural Politics in 20 20th Century America, um, which is published by Penn State University Press 2012, and Remembering Emmett Till, which was published by University of Chicago Press in 2019. Remembering Emmett Till was listed as a 2019 Book of the Year by The Economist and a winner of the Mississippi Historical Society's 2020 McLemore Prize. Professor Tell is a former fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities and a co-director of the Emmett Till Memory Project. His writing on the Till murder has been published in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Atlantic Monthly, Lit Hub, and a wide range of academic journals. He is a past president of the American Society for the History of Rhetoric and the inaugural public humanities officer for the, Hist for the Rhetoric Society of America. Professor Tell is also co-director of the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities and a faculty fellow in the University Honors Program. He holds courtesy appointments in American Studies and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Um, and his talk today titled Remembering Emmett Till. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Dave. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, that was a great introduction. Thank you, Krista, for those words. There are, uh, I think we've been more eloquent on memory in the introductory remarks than I will be in the keynote address. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and as Krista noted, it took a large team and I've been looking back through my emails to try and figure out just how many people it took to pull this off. And I just wanna give some shout outs both to Amanda and to Kelly Jensen and to Krista Olson and to Marissa Fernholz and Tori Thompson-Peters and Sarah McKinnon and John Cobit and Ilya Miriam Pig, all of whom I know by email trains and there's probably others, but at least I know you from my emails have been involved and I wanna say thank you. And I also wanna say what a great honor it is to open the public memory and present tensions symposium. And so also big thanks to RSA and to um, the departments at the University of Wisconsin that are making this possible. I've not said this often, but I'm actually grateful for Zoom uh, that it's making things like this possible. But this afternoon in particular, Zoom comes with a little bit of pain. And that's because you're in Madison and I'm not. Uh, I haven't run the numbers, but of all the cities that I've never lived in, I kind of think I have more colleagues and friends in Madison than any other city anywhere. And so like, I, well, it's great to be with you and I love seeing your faces on the screen. Um, wow, I wish we could uh, be together in person and I trust that will happen before too long. Let me uh, pause here and share some slides with you. I wanna begin this afternoon's lecture with two acknowledgements. First, I wanna dedicate this lecture to the late Alvin Sykes who died last month here in Kansas City. Mr. Sykes was born into poverty and he never escaped it. He lived in public housing, but he visited the Oval Office. He is the founder of the Emmett Till Justice Campaign and the author 
of the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act. That's an act signed into law by George W. Bush that authorized the FBI to investigate civil rights cold cases. As a teenager, Alvin Sykes dropped out of high school and began spending his hours in the downtown branch of the Kansas City Public Library in the section where the law journals were kept. And if you fast forward to 2004, when the DOJ was considering investigating the Till case for the first time, it was Alvin with his uncredentialed but expert legal education who found the technical means to open a federal investigation. He drove from Kansas City to Chicago where he met Till's mother and with her blessing from there to Oxford, Mississippi, where he convinced the FBI to open the case for the first time. Over the last five years, I've had the honor of speaking alongside Alvin in Kansas City and hosting him for a memorable evening in downtown Lawrence. And I wanna note that he died as he lived in pursuit of the Till story. He slipped in the train station on his way to visit the Till family in Chicago and he never recovered. And some of the stories I'm gonna share with you tonight would still be untold and they would still be unknown were it not for the pioneering work of Alvin Sykes. So big thanks to him. Second acknowledgement, we're gonna spend a fair amount of time this afternoon talking about how racism has altered our history and in some cases erased our history. And in light of these themes, we might start by acknowledging another lost history that I am telling these stories on land that was taken from the Ka, the Sioux, the Osage and the Kickapoo. And I don't, know these histories, but I do know that if we don't tell our stories and claim our histories, they will be taken from us. So let's start with a history lesson. Uh, the year is 1955. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old African-American boy living in Chicago. In August of that year, while visiting his cousins in the Mississippi Delta, he whistled at Carolyn Bryant, the 21-year-old shopkeeper of Bryant's Grocery in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. Three days later, he was lynched. He was kidnapped, tortured, shot, and dropped in a river. Three days after that, his body was found. One month after that, two of the murderers were acquitted by an all-white jury. And three months after the trial, Martin Luther King heard Till's story told from the pulpit of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and he never forgot it. Eight years later, on June 23rd, 1963, King was in Detroit and he was still talking about Emmett Till, and you might recognize his language. He said, I have a dream this afternoon that there will be a day when we no longer face the atrocities that Emmett Till had to face. Two months later, and you know this, King gave his I Have a Dream speech a second time. It worked so well in Detroit that he tried it again, this time from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. But when he gave the speech a second time, two things happened. First, the speech became famous, perhaps, or certainly the most famous speech in the American Civil Rights Movement. But a second thing happened. The reference to Emmett Till was cut. In the same moment that the speech became the primary document of the civil rights movement, Emmett Till lost his place in that document. Now, I don't imagine that King cut Till intentionally. The speech, as, as you know, was something of a jazz performance, a little bit different every time. But intentional or not, the erasure of Till from the official text of the civil rights movement proved all too prophetic because for the remainder of the 20th century, Till's story was never well told. In fact, and get this, 49 years and 11 months separate the murder from the first dollar dropped on Till commemoration in the state of Mississippi. 
And I have a hunch that I can, by a simple collaborative exercise that I'm going to ask you to participate in, demonstrate that Till's story has never been well distributed. In just a second, when I ask you to do so, I want you to put a number in the chat. No explanation, just a number. And that number should be the age that you were when you first learned Till's story. There is no shame if that day is today. And there is no shame if you've known that story since you were three years old. I was in my 20s. How old were you? Go ahead and just put that number in the chat. The last time I did this exercise, the range stretched from five to 45. I don't think we have quite that wide of a range today, although we might, the numbers are going by too fast for me to look at them. But I just want you to take in the range and I want you to especially like, rather than note the particular number, note the range of numbers. And the lesson I want you to learn from this exercise are the same lessons I hope you learn from the fact that 50 years passed before a single memorial to Emmett Till was ever put up in the state of Mississippi. And the lessons are, that history is not an equally distributed resource and that if we don't tell our stories, they will be taken from us. Now, I imagine as we dive into these ranges, these numbers, there are stories lurking behind every one of them. And part of me wishes we could, could, could pause here on these stories, but we don't have time for that at the moment. So I wanna tell you that in 2005, 18 local citizens in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, nine of them white and nine of them black, decided that the 50 year silence was intolerable. And so they organized, they fundraised, and they used a $15,000 donation from Morgan Freeman to do something that had never been done before. They told Till's story on the landscape of the Mississippi Delta. And when commemoration did come and it came on, in, on July 1st, 2005, this was the first sign ever to be put up. It was plagued by vandalism. And I have a hunch that you've seen some of this in the news. And I just wanna note that the vandalism is important politically, it's important historically, but it's also important personally, because this is how I got involved with the case. Now I had been writing and publishing about Emmett Till commemoration well before the vandalism started. But in 2014, I was invited to Mississippi for a three-day summit on telling Till's story in the context of vandalism. And that three-day visit changed the course of my career. It, val it, it altered the values I hold dear and was the origin point of the stories I'm gonna share with you this afternoon. The family of Emmett Till was there, the FBI was there, and a handful of historians were there. I'm going to scroll through some of the photos, including this most famous one to be installed this August in the entryway of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. This one is filled with 317 bullet holes, we know, because we sent it to ballistics in Jackson. I don't have time to tell you the stories behind each of these signs. I'll spend some more time talking. Well, let me tell you this. Um, this vandalism was the root. It was that that meeting in 2014, that three day summit where we first decided to make a smartphone app uh, to tell Till's story. You know, the logic was quite simple. If people can shoot a sign, it is harder to shoot an app. It took a long time, but in August of 2019, we launched the Emmett Till Memory Project. I'm gonna talk more about this project tomorrow at the Public Humanities Roundtable. And so I'm not gonna spend any time on it uh, this afternoon, other than to plead with you to please download the project. It's free and it helps us a great deal. But in the process of making the smartphone app, the Emmett Till Memory Project, two amazing things happened. First, 
we created the country's first bulletproof historical marker. This sign weighs 500 pounds and it costs $12,000. I wrote the prose for the sign and spoke at the dedication alongside a few members of the Till family. And second, as I was researching the app and driving around the Delta, I began to hear stories about the murder that I had never heard before. And that caught me off guard because by this time, this was 2015 now, I had been publishing about the murder for 10 years. And I thought I knew what stories were out there. But these were not stories about the murder. They were about the story of the murder and the ways that that story has changed over time about who changed it and to what ends. And these stories that I discovered while I was trying to make the Emmett Till Memory Project for a nonprofit in the Delta, these stories became the foundation of my book. Remembering Emmett Till is filled with stories about how people have changed the facts of the murder to benefit themselves financially, racially, or both. And all I wanna do this afternoon is share three examples of this with you, three stories, each about how racism and the pursuit of money are changing the story of Till's murder. Three stories, and then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, feel free to throw questions in the chat, feel free um, to raise your hand or to use the Q&A button. Um, Amanda and Kelly can help me when time comes, make sure I don't, don't miss anything. And I, let me encourage you to be bold with your questions. The story of, of Emmett Till commemoration is ongoing, right? Just last week, ABC was in the Delta uh, filming a 12-part miniseries that's going to air next year. Uh, a senator from Illinois just announced Emmett Till legislation two weeks ago. And there are more, um, like the Smithsonian's getting, like Till commemoration is an ongoing story. I, I was on the phone yesterday about it. Um, and I tell you this because I'm only gonna be able to scratch the surface of, uh, of Emmett Till commemoration in these three stories I'm gonna tell you, but I want to welcome any questions you might have about anything um, Emmett Till related to Emmett Till commemoration. So I, I know I'm, 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 I'm not, not talking about everything that's going on because that would be impossible. Okay, so three stories and that's it. The first story is about the erasure of Sunflower County. The only thing you need to know is that Sunflower County is the site of Till's murder. And you would think that as the site of the murder, it would be relatively well adorned with commemorative work, but the opposite is the case. Sun Sunflower County still has not a single memorial and it did not just happen that way. This is the story of how Sunflower County was written out of Till's story. The story begins at 7 p.m. on the night of October 28th, 1955. That's two months after the murder and one month after the trial. And the freelance journalist, William Bradford Huey, is meeting with two of the murderers, their wives, and their lawyers to share a bottle of whiskey and swap stories. Because Huey, he's the journalist, he wanted to, to tell the story of Till's murder for Look Magazine, but the murder was two months in the past and he knew that his only chance of publishing yet another story was if he had the story from the perspective of the murderers themselves. And so he paid them. He paid murderers J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant $3,150 and their lawyers $1,269. And in exchange, they signed consent and release forms that looked like this. You don't need to read the fine print, but these forms were the price of publication as Look Magazine refused to print the story unless every named participant signed a waiver. In letters of October 12 and October 18th, William Bradford Huey told his editor at Look that he knew that four men were involved in the murder and he boasted that he could name them all. But by October 23rd, he knew that he could only obtain waivers from the two men 
who had already been tried and were therefore no longer in legal jeopardy. So he wrote his boss another letter, and here I'm reading, quote, there were not, after all, four men in the murder and abduction party. There were only two. And thus, because he could only obtain two of these consent and release forms, the murder party shrank from four people to two people, and this would move the murder site across county lines. During the trial, a sharecropper named Willie Reed testified for the prosecution that the murder happened in this barn near the town of Drew in Sunflower County. And this was true. But Huey could not tell this story because the only reason that the murder happened in this barn in Sunflower County was that murderer J.W. Milam's brother, Leslie, there managed the Sturdivant Plantation on which there was a barn sufficiently isolated for the purposes of the night. But Leslie Milam had not been tried. He did not sign a release form and thus he could not be implicated in Huey's story. So William Bradford Huey moved the murder site 16.5 miles east to an abandoned spot of riverbank along the Tallahatchie River in Tallahatchie County. Now, in January of 1956, that's when this look piece emerges, January of 56. What's that like five months after the murder? This was an unprecedented geography because Huey was the first to suggest a two county version of the murder in which Till was kidnapped in LaFleur County before being killed and disposed of in Tallahatchie County. The influence of his story is relatively easy to track. All you have to do is look at the maps. Before Huey's story, maps of the Till murder looked like this. Note that there are three counties. Sunflower County is in blue and the barn is clearly identified. The amazing part is what happened after Huey's story was published in January of 1956. Every single map of the murder published between 1956 and 2005 including this one from 1963, this one from 1988, and this one from 2010, placed the murder in Tallahatchie County and left Sunflower County off of the map entirely. Now, who cares? This question haunts me because of the person who first asked it to me. When I first met Till's cousin, the late Simeon Wright in 2014, he told me, it doesn't really matter where Till was killed. What matters, he explained, was the fact that he was killed and that he was killed for being the wrong color at the wrong time in the wrong place. And until his passing, Mr. Wright refused to travel to Sunflower County. And as you can see here, in 2010, when he published his own account of the murder, he left Sunflower County off of his map. Now, I get his point. We don't want to get so lost in the minutia of the murder that we forget the basic issue of racism. But the only reason that Sunflower County was eliminated from the itinerary of Till's lynching was to protect white murderer Leslie Milam from prosecution. And so when I focus on the question of where Till was killed, I am not trying to evade the all important question of race. I'm trying to suggest that racism has infected more of Till's story than we have ever acknowledged, that even these maps are products of racism. Why? Because claiming that Till was killed in Tallahatchie County is another way of saying that only two men were guilty and both of them faced a jury of their peers. And although none of that is true, for those who visit the Delta, it remains all too easy to think that Till was killed in Tallahatchie County. Because to this day, Tallahatchie County is packed with memorials while the murder site sits unmarked on private property on the premises of a local dentist. And Sunflower County is the, uh, remains the only relevant county in the Mississippi Delta without a single memorial to Till's murder. It is almost as if the barren landscape of the county is doing its part to hide the guilt of Leslie Milam. 
So that's it for story number one. Can you see how racism and the pursuit of profit are shifting the story of Till's final night? I'm not gonna go into this now, but if you're curious, feel free to, to, to um, ask this in the Q&A. There, there are movements afoot to turn this, pro to commemorate this property. Uh, the, a, a dentist named Dr. Jeff Andrews lives here and he's wonderful and he's working with the, the nonprofit and others. And so th it could well be the case that five years from now, this site is commemorated. Okay, story number two is about Brian's Grocery and Meat Market and, uh, in, the, in the town of Money, that's the name of the town, the town of Money, Mississippi. Uh, this, is, this is where Emmett Till whistled, and uh, this is what it looked like in 1955. Um, before I jump into the story, let me just uh, flash some pictures in front of you. The years have not been kind to Brian's Grocery. It was put on the market three months after the trial because, as you can imagine, the sharecroppers who kept Bryant's grocery in business boycotted the store and forced the Bryant's out of business. Check out this next jump from the late 90s to the early 2000s or mid 2000s. Uh, that's the effect of Hurricane Katrina, which took a roof and a story sized portion of the grocery's north wall. That's December. 2000, sorry, that's fall of 17, that's December of 18. Uh, that's one of my favorites from 2011. Uh, and you can't see it in this particular picture, but if you were to go there today, there was a sign out in front, I'll show the sign to you later, that identifies this grocery store as ground zero of the American civil rights movement. Now that's a claim that you hear a lot in Mississippi. It's, you know, it's, I don't want to get into whether or not it's True, we'll call it plausible. But the only thing I want to know is, isn't it strange that a building identified as ground zero of the civil rights movement would be allowed to fall into ruin? Well, just like Sunflower County was pushed out of the story, Bryant's grocery didn't just fall into ruin. I'm going to tell you the story of why this building is falling over. The ruins are only half the story, although you can't tell by looking. In 2011, the town of Money was the beneficiary of a $206,000 Mississippi Civil Rights Historical Sites Grant. But the grant went not to Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market, the only site in town with civil rights history, rather, it went to Ben Roy's service station, a long shuttered house and canopy style golf station that sits precisely 67 feet south of the crumbling grocery. Because Bryant's was crumbling and because Ben Roy's had a covered portico, the grant application reasoned, the gas station had become a default lecture site from which tourists could gaze at the grocery and learn their civil rights history. The application put its case for civil rights dollars like this. And here I quote, it is very likely that the events that transpired at Bryant's Grocery were discussed underneath the front canopy of the adjacent service station. And with nothing more than that, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History gave $200,000 earmarked for civil rights to the restoration of Ben Roy's. The renovation was completed in 2014, and it is, or specifically was, beautiful. But it makes no reference to Emmett Till civil rights history or the building to its north. The original gas pumps have been reinstalled. The living quarters in the back have been well appointed. And Ben Roy's now stands as a charming, nostalgic period piece, a reminder of what day-to-day -day life in the Mississippi Delta might have looked like had racism not coursed through every facet of its life. 
But these were civil rights dollars and the grant was funded by the memory of Till's murder. If Emmett Till had not been killed, this gas station would still be a ruin. Making matters even more complex, Ben Roy's service station and Bryant's grocery are both owned by the same family, the Tribbles. And this raises an interesting question. Why was a Mississippi civil rights historical sites grant invested in a period piece with no civil rights history rather than a civil rights historical site, especially when such a site is next door and owned by the grantees? There are three uh, possible answers to this question. All of them contain a measure of truth. Uh, first, there is the issue of finances. I always have a hard time saying this, but the complete restoration of Ben Roy's cost a third of what it would have cost to simply stabilize the grocery. Uh, uh, from what I understand, once a building loses its roof, things get exponentially more expensive. And so perhaps Ben Roy's was just a better commemorative deal. Second, and this is where it gets sticky, uh, uh, grantees Annette Morgan and Harry Tribble are the children of Ray Tribble, an unrepentant juror from the Emmett Till trial. After the trial, the elder Tribble became a massively successful farmer, bought everything in the town of money except the Baptist church and was an active member in the local Democratic Party. Till his dying day, he never lost his conviction that the murderers were innocent and the body was planted by the NAACP. His children, the current owners of Bryant's Grocery, seem unwilling to allow the crumbling store to be turned into a monument to their father's complicity in allowing Milam and Bryant to walk free, at least not for anything less than seven figures. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like as well. Third, and this is what I want to focus on, uh, nostalgia, the restoration of Ben Roy's, whitewashed the Delta's racial history by recalling a nostalgic but fictional account of days gone by. Here's how it happened. A restored Ben Roy's, the family wrote, and here I'm reading from the grant application again will allow visitors to step back in time to the summer of 1955 into rural Money, Mississippi. At that time, Ben Roy's was not simply a service station. It was also a front stoop for the community, a place where locals went for refreshments and conversation. Markers of racial hierarchy would not be totally absent from the restoration. On the north side of the building, the family promised that the restrooms would once again be marked, quote, colored and white as they were during segregation. The restored building was to become something of a visitor center or a cultural center, those are their words, from which tourists could learn the history of segregation. But the application makes segregation itself seem rather charming. A jukebox, a jukebox once stood on the porch at Red, and on weekend nights, blacks and whites alike gathered to quote, shed their work week blues and enjoy the jukebox at Ben Roy's. My fear is that Ben Roy's took civil rights money and invested it in a period piece designed to evoke nostalgia for racially promiscuous front stoop Saturday nights that never happened. And here it's important to remember that the very first businesses in the Delta to be boycotted during the civil rights movement were white owned service stations as early as 1951 before lunch counters or bus stations or swimming pools became a thing. Gas stations were the first lightning rods of black inequality and it is difficult for me to imagine that a front porch jukebox could overcome the racial charge attached to them. So don't be fooled by the nostalgia of Ben Royce. I can't say for sure if it ever actually attracted integrated socializers, but I do know that the Jim Crow signage that once marked the bathrooms was never restored. In all honesty, this was probably a wise choice, but without these signs, the service station contains not a single gesture to Emmett Till, racial violence, or the civil rights 
movement. With old fashioned gas pumps and idyllic living quarters filled with Americana, the restored Ben Roy's is wholly given over to the nostalgia of mid-century small town life. It's a beautiful building, but its beauty was funded by unacknowledged racial violence. And here I get to read you a sentence that some of my editors have liked to cut over the years, but I don't think my editors are in the room. So here we go. I can't look at Ben Roy's without fearing that it might not be the perfect model of what red capped Trump supporters might see when they look backwards to a once great America. They see gas stations and more broadly an entire American infrastructure made possible by economies of race, but unmarked by legacies of violence. Because leaving the violence unmarked, as Ben Royce does, is the only possible way to hold up mid-century America as a bastion of greatness. And this is the tragic irony of Ben Roy's. Its restoration was paid for literally by the memory of Till's murder. But the finished product sanitizes the racial history of the Delta and makes that murder seem unlikely. Okay, I have one more slide to show you uh, for story number two for the story of uh, Ben Roy's. This is a tweet from Jahan Jones. I don't know if you follow Jahan Jones. I, I commend him to you. He uh, is uh, writes about race for the Huffington Post. And in October of 2019, he, I, and some others spent a couple days together in the Mississippi Delta. I just want to just look at this tweet. He got there a day before I did. And this I wasn't along for the ride yet. He says, powerful first day in Mississippi. Here is Bryant's grocery. But wait a second, he took a picture of the wrong building. That's not Bryant's grocery, okay? And you guys are like, how could Jahan Jones, like Jahan Jones is brilliant, right? He knows the civil rights movement well. He's a great writer. How could he, how could he get this wrong? Well, that sign that you're looking at on the left side of his tweet is precisely 33 and a half feet from each building. Right, and I bet you can figure out why it splits the difference between Bryant's Grocery and Ben Roy's, right? Because the county needed a way to put up, sorry, the state, this is a state sign actually. The state needed a way to put up the sign without asking permission of the Triple family. So they had to put it on the right of way that split the difference between the two buildings. In one respect, it was a brilliant move, but I can assure you that Jahan Jones, is not the only one who's told me that they went to the wrong building, right? And there's there's nothing on this sign, it just says here's ground zero, and then it leaves you to figure it out. Um, the same reason Jahan Jones took a picture of the wrong building is the same reason Bryant's grocery has been allowed to crumble. So I'll leave it there, but can you see how once again, racism and the pursuit of money are changing the story? of Till's murder. Okay, last story. This one is a little bit shorter. The story is about the town of Glendora, Mississippi. The only thing you need to know about Glendora is uh, it is one of the most poverty stricken towns in one of the most poverty-stricken regions, in one of the most poverty-stricken states in the nation. Glendora is saturated with memorials. The tiny town of five streets has 18 signs dedicated to the memory of Emmett Till and the only museum in the world dedicated entirely to the Till story. It's called the Ethic Museum or the Emmett Till Historic Intrepid Center. Now these memorials, the 18 signs in the museum tell a unique version of Till's story on two counts. And here, I apologize, we need to dive into sort of the weeds, the details of Till, the minutia of the story for a few moments um, in order to make this story run. Ah, 
They tell a unique version of Till's story on two counts. Uh, first, while well, virtually every 20th century history of Till's murder suggests that the murderers dropped the body in the Tallahatchie River, the commemorative work in Glendora suggests that Till was dropped into a tributary known as the Black Bayou from a bridge on the south side of Glendora. According to this account, the bayou then carried Till's body for three miles to the Tallahatchie River where it was recovered. Second, while no historian has been able to say with certainty where the murderers obtained the fan they used to weigh down Till, Till's body, the Glendora Museum claims that the fan was stolen from the Glendora cotton gin, presumably by Elmer Kimball, a gin employee a member of the murder party and the next door neighbor of the confessed murderer, J.W. Milam. And so at issue here are the bridge, the gin, and by extension, the complicity of Elmer Kimball. And while these variations on the finer points of Till's story may seem like academic minutia, to Glendora residents, they are matters so weighty that it sometimes seems as if the very future of the town hinges on where Till's body was dropped in the water and with what fan it was weighed down. In 2010, the Mississippi Development Authority sent a team of economic development experts to Glendora. Their charge was to rescue the town from poverty but they couldn't come up with anything. Aside from the unrealistic suggestion that the town turn, the snake infested land along the bayou into quote riverfront property, the development authority's only other proposal was that Glendora capitalize on its connection to the till murder. More commemoration they said would bring more tourists and more tourists would bring more money. None of this was news to Mayor Johnny B. Thomas. Since 2005, the mayor had been promoting a Glendora-centric narrative of the murder in which Till's body was dropped in the Black Bayou, tied with the fan from the local gin. But unfortunately for Glendora, the mayor has a powerful antagonist, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. That state agency, Archives and History, has invested more money into Till's commemoration than any other organization. But they simply don't believe that Till was dropped in the bayou or the fan stolen from a local gin. And so while Archives and History has funded virtually every other Till request in the last 20 years, even Ben Roy's, they refuse to fund Glendora. From the perspective of the MDAH, that's Archives and History, Glendora's theories may be plausible, but they are not verifiable. And because verifiability is a prerequisite for funding, the mayor has one state agency, the Development Authority, telling him to invest until commemoration, and another state agency, Archives and History, refusing to fund his every effort to do so. And so, without the support of the MDAH, Mayor Thomas has gotten creative. On September 27, 27, 2005, the United States Department of Agriculture awarded a Community Connect broadband grant to the village of Glendora. Funded at $325,000, the grant was intended to bring broadband connectivity to Glendora. Mayor Thomas used the USDA money to convert the old cotton gin into a community computer lab with internet access. This much was part of the plan. But after the grant was approved, he fired his contractor, hired several members of his own family and a number of state prisoners to construct the world's first Emmett Till Museum, the Emmett Till Historic Intrepid Center, which was also located in the gin. Although the USDA approved the expenses, it does not seem that they knew that their money was being used to build a museum. In the 647 pages of records preserved by the USDA, including the application, labor contracts, invoices, and correspondence, 
the name of Emmett Till is not once mentioned. After the grant ran out, Glendora couldn't pay the bills and the internet service was discontinued within two months. The museum, on the other hand, is still going strong 15 years later. It is maintained on a day-to-day -day basis by the Glendora Economic and Community Development Corporation. That's a 501c3 founded by Mayor Thomas and known by locals as JEDCO. The town has assigned most, if not all, public business to the nonprofit. JEDCO pays city workers, operates 24 Section 8 apartments, and operates the Till Museum. According to public records, the public housing funnels about $100,000 a year of federal HUD money into the nonprofit. With this money, the nonprofit maintains the apartments, pays city workers, and critically subsidizes the Till Museum, which otherwise would have been in the red every single year. In the most literal way possible, the poverty of the townspeople is keeping the doors of the museum open. It was built with USDA money and is maintained with HUD money. And access to both of these pots of money hinged on poverty rather than history. When I am in Jackson, the state capital, a couple hours south of, of Glendora, the staff at Archives and History have cautioned me on numerous occasions to treat Mayor Thomas's claims with a grain of salt. From the perspective of the MDAH, Archives and History, what matters is the provability of history. And since it's difficult to prove Mayor Thomas's claims, the MDAH has chosen not to fund Glendora. But the closer you get to Glendora, the more it seems that poverty matters more than provability. And this is where Mayor Thomas shines. Even without the support of the MDAH, he has managed to leverage the poverty of the town to build a museum, the very thing that the MDA told him he needed, but the MDAH refused to fund. Now, to be sure, the historical questions remain unanswered. Was Emmett Till actually dropped from the Black Bayou Bridge? Was the fan stolen from the local gin? And was Elmer Kimball involved? Maybe. I'd even put money on it. But it's neither my place nor my point to weigh in on the truthfulness of these claims. Rather, I want to focus on the ways that poverty is changing the story we think we know about Till's final night. Thomas, the mayor, has been able to leverage the town's poverty to support the museum, and the museum in turn supports Glendora's plausible but unverifiable theories of Till's murder. Had Glendora been wealthy, there'd be little incentive to stick to this version of the story. The Black Bayou Bridge would be lost to memory and Elmer Kimball would rarely appear in stories of Till's final night. But Glendora is not wealthy and its poverty is reshaping the story of Till's murder. Stories about Elmer Kimball, the Glendora Cotton Gin, and the Black Bayou Bridge continue to circulate most recently by the New York Times, but they are sustained and preserved by nothing more than the poverty of the town. Okay, that's it. Thank you uh, for listening. Um, it looks like we have a good long time for questions and, and I welcome anything at, at this point. And I'll, I'll jump in and assist if need be. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, and it looks like we've already got a question in the chat. I'll just type a couple of, or I'll just put in the chat a couple of really basic guidelines. So to ask a question, either um, type your question in the chat or use Zoom's hand raise feature and one of us will call on you. Um, in either case, try and state your name and organization first. And then um, ideally your one sentence question-ish, and then a few sentences to clarify your question if necessary. Great, thank you. Should I leave the slides up? The only downside of doing so is I only get to see like six, five of you at a time, and so I can't see hands raised. Um, I can, what do you think? I, 
I think it's fine to unshare for a Q&A so we can see each other. Okay. If you need to share again to show something, I think that's. Oh, there you are. Uh, OK, so I see a question here about the archival research process. And I'll just, I have a, I have a story that I love to tell about the archives. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, it's a story that I've written out. It's going to be published um, in a volume that's coming out sometime in the next year by, edited by Christy Moss and Brandon Inabinet on, on Southern regionalism. And it's a story, and, 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 and it's, it's about the archives of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission which is the nonprofit I've worked with since 2014. And uh, they, they kept these super detailed three, uh, three inch binders, like super thick ones filled with minutes and no one had ever seen them. And I, I knew of these long before I saw them. And so um, I spent years trying to track down and gain permission uh, to look at these minutes. And when I found them, they underwrote all of what became chapter three of my book. And I didn't talk about chapter three this afternoon, um, but, but they were very important. And I just want to tell you this crazy story. So I went to Mississippi and I took um, the uh, administrative assistant of the commission out to lunch at Tallahatchie County's only, only sit down restaurant. It's a black owned woman owned restaurant that is flourishing in the new till ecosystem down there. Uh, but but I, I, I took her out to lunch and uh, we talked for a long time and I said, may I please see the minutes of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission? I was very upfront. I told her I was trying to write a book about the commission. And she said, that's not mine to grant. You're gonna have to ask um, Frank Mishner. And Frank was the white co-chair of, of, the, of the nonprofit and his office was right across the town square from this restaurant. So I, I paid for like, I left the lunch and walked across the town square to Frank's office. And I just walked into the most gracious old world office you can imagine. Like if you can imagine old white guy money, he's, a, he, he's literally a planter, like picture his, like this is what I walked into. Um, he had a soft spot for some history. And so he was taken with someone who, who he confused for a historian. Um, and eventually I was able to ask if I could see the minutes of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission. And he said, well, Dave, that's not my permission to give. You need the permission of the black co-chair, John Wilchie. And I said, thank you, Frank. Can you give me his contact information? I'd love to reach out to Mr. Wilchie. And Frank said, no, I'm not going to do that. But here's what I'll do. I'll call Mr. Wilchie for you. And if he says it's OK, I'll call you back. And I walked out of Frank's office pretty dejected. I was positive that I was never going to see these minutes. This was like the classic Southern, oh, I'm going to take care of you. But well, lo and behold, I was driving back to my hotel that afternoon and Frank calls and Frank gives me an address and he says, be there at 830 tomorrow morning. And in my sheer excitement, I didn't think to ask any relevant questions like, where is this? And why am I going here? But I got up the next morning, plugged the address into my phone, drove, actually the, the, the directions took me through Glendora, out the other side, uh, into sort of my, like miles of country road until I couldn't see anyone. And I pull up and I get there and it takes me to this big metal building with one door and only a couple windows. And all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, where am I? And why didn't I ask more questions yesterday on the phone, right? But I checked the address, I checked my GPS, I opened the door and I walked into one of the single most lush office buildings I've ever been inside. It turns out that the that that unassuming metal building surrounded by miles of cotton fields was actually the headquarters of the Sturdivant plantation. Um, the Sturdivants are it's a big name in the Delta. Uh, they made their money flying those planes over the fields that dropped the chemicals. Um, it's, they're good people. They're some of the only white people who publicly speak up for racial justice in the Mississippi Delta. They have long run a chain of hotels, which were among the first to integrate in the 1950s. And it turns out that the administrative assistant of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission was also the administrative assistant of the Sturdivant. I think of it as the Sturdivant Empire. They run some gubernatorial campaigns out of that building as well. Um, and I said, Martha Ann, that was her name. 
imagine seeing you here. She's like, I was expecting you. And she walks me back to this long conference table, probably 20 feet long. It's surrounded by all these like game heads on the wall. Uh, and she like just puts these three big binders in front of me. And I'm setting up my camera and my tripod, making small talk. And I'm about to open them. And she says, wait, you can't look at those. I say, pardon me? And she's like, John Wilchie is going to be here in about 10 minutes. And he's going to talk to you first. And if he says you can look at him, you can look at him. So uh, John Wilchie shows up. And in this Southern accent, so deep, I can hardly make it out. I tell him what I'm doing. He says, Dave, it's great. I'd love for you to write a book about us. But tell me, what do we get out of this deal? And the timing could not have been better because just a couple months earlier, a grant that I had written for the commission was funded at a level of like $140,000 and was keeping their doors open. And so I was able to say, well, you know that grant that you, that 140,000, I wrote that grant for you. And he just like, I mean, I'll never forget his big smile. And he just like pushed those binders uh, across the table at me. Uh, and then curiously, Martha Ann took one of them back. Uh, she's like, you can look at the first two because the first two are the um, official minutes and I got to look at them. And, but Martha Ann's like, that third one, that's just my personal reflections and I'm not going to let you see that. And of course, when you hear that, you want to see the third binder, right? Uh, and so the story goes on. Like I, I, I get through the two binders, I take off, I go home, I never see the third binder, but I'm back there six months later for a, for, for a Christmas party for the nonprofit. And at this Christmas party, lo and behold, there's Martha Ann Clark. And I say, and you know, um, Martha Ann says, uh, she says, are you going to come see us again, Dave? And I said, well, if I can see that third binder. And she made some comment about like, if you come back this summer, you can see whatever you want. And I remembered that. And so when I landed in Jackson that next summer, my first phone call before it was an off the plane was to Martha Ann Clark. And I'm like, Martha, I can be at your office in two hours. Can I see that third binder? And she said, yes. But then I got there and she played dumb again. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no third binder. And I got ready. I'm like, OK, I'm like, whatever. So I began to leave. I'm like, I could have sworn there was a third binder. But if there's not, I'm just going to make my way up, up the road to the hotel. And at that point, she's like, well, OK, you can look at it. And so she, she let me look at the third binder. And I have to tell you, there were no smoking guns in the third binder. I've been pursuing this for so long that I thought I was on the verge of something huge, and I wasn't. Uh, really, all it helped me do was kind of calibrate particular names with particular arguments that I had found in the other two binders. Um, but still, it reminds me, uh, it's a great story about archives and redefining what counts as archives. Um, and how we sort of work with communities. You know, I never would have seen those minutes and I never would have been able to write chapter three had I not been first doing work for the nonprofit, right? Trying to help them meet their goals because it was only after I was helping them meet their goals that they let me have access to those minutes. So I've, I've, I've told this story a lot because I've learned a lot of lessons from it actually. I can read the, the next question in the chat. So it's from Margaret Baker, a PhD student at uh, NC State University. Fantastic lecture, Professor Tell. Your work focuses on a media ecology approach to the Till murder. How do you feel the objects affect the commemoration of the case, i.e. the casket in the Smithsonian, the photographs published in Jet and periodicals, et cetera? Is there a difference in how these objects commemorate the case rather than the landscape of the Delta? Yeah, that's a great question, Margaret. Thank you. I mean, I think the, the, the thing, thing, thing that jumps out to me immediately is that the two objects that you mention, the caskets and the Johnson, the David Jackson photograph that ran first in Jet and then in the Defender, are both Chicago artifacts. Um, and so the, the Till story played a lot differently and was commemorated a lot differently in Chicago than it was in Mississippi, a lot earlier in Chicago for that matter. Um, uh, the, the David Jackson photograph, I mean, that's if, if there is sort of a case to be made for till jumpstarting the civil rights movement, as people in Mississippi like to argue, the strongest case for that argument runs through that David Jackson photograph. Um, 
which, I mean, the Ladner sisters, John Lewis, I mean, it recruited so many people into the, that photograph in particular recruited so many people into the movement. Um, and of course, a lot of people know that now because of uh, John Lewis's posthumous op-ed in which he said, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. And what he meant and what he said more precisely on other occasions was the David Jackson photograph of Emmett Till is what drew me into the movement. Um, and so I would say that those, the, both in Chicago and in Mississippi, the story that gets told really spins around the different objects that center the story. In Chicago, it's the, I mean, the casket doesn't become a thing, honestly, until 04. Uh, and so that's a completely different story, but especially that photograph, that was a thing really early. But in the Mississippi Delta, the relevant objects are like internet infrastructure, the path of the rivers, the depth of the topsoil. Um, I, I talk about some of the, the building of a courthouse, flood prevention, um, those are the uh, playgrounds, and I know I haven't told all these stories today, but I'll just note that you can calibrate what stories get told by focusing on what objects appear in what places. Sarah, do you want to ask your question? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Thank you so much, Dave. This was really fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And uh, I feel especially honored. We just read your piece uh, in Advances in History and Rhetoric last night for class. So everything is so fresh in my mind. And um, something that's been on my mind uh, as I think about your work in relation to some of the stuff that uh, I've been writing about recently is how we consider, think about going about um, commemoration or memorializing for forms of violence that are still very much happening and alive and ongoing. And so uh, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about that as you, I mean, as you think about what you've learned from um, the, the till memorializing, even though, you know, so that was a particularized event, we can still think about the, the tracks of futurity and present that are that are alive in, in, in that form of violence, right? So how, how, how do we go about memorializing for violences that are still very much ongoing, present, alive, happening in the now? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Because um, and, and in some ways, the Till story is less particular than you might think, right? In some ways, the Till story is one of the things that's still going, right? And 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 this Till story is very tied up with, I mean, I love the way Krista opened our conversation, tying the Till story to George Floyd, among others. And I could just give you this anecdote, and this caught me off guard. I shouldn't have been surprised by it, but I was. If you look at downloads of the Emmett Till Memory Project in the weeks before and the weeks after the murder of George Floyd, in the weeks after that violence, downloads of the Emmett Till Memory Project spiked fourfold. We were averaging 14 downloads per week, and suddenly for the next couple of weeks after George Floyd, we were averaging 64 downloads a week. And I don't know quite what the lesson there is, but it's something lurking along the lines of, in these moments of heightened racial unrest, there is a stronger felt desire. And here I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, but it seems like there's a stronger felt desire for new stories about the Black past. That commemoration is made more, even like till commemoration in all its particularity has become made more important by the ongoing sort of endless cycle of anti-Black violence and police violence in particular. Another, another comment I'll make, and this is something I've been thinking about very recently, which ties in. I've noted one, one thing that strikes me about protest, about racial protest in the last five years, is that the geography of racial protest has changed, right? So I think of sort of this opening moment of the 1960s when the dominant geography of racial protest was the lunch counter, right? You know, it starts in North Carolina and then spreads throughout the country. And, and at the lunch counters, something very particular was at stake, right? The right to inhabit public space. But what we've seen since 2015 is the geography of racial protests shift and it's shifted of all places to memorial sites, right? And so I've been thinking about the ways that 
memorial sites have become the new lunch counters. And one of the things I think that's at stake in that shift is the importance of storytelling, right? It's, it's almost as if we've recognized in this moment that what was won at the lunch counters, the right to inhabit public space is not, it's not good enough if it's sort of restricted to the mere physical presence of others, right? That, that these protesters at memorial sites outside the Derek Chauvin trial right now, what they're reminding us of, right? Um, or what they're, what they're giving us is a vision of America um, in which everyone's allowed in public space and everyone's allowed to tell their stories in public space. And I think that's why, um, or that's a, perhaps one reason why the geography of protest has shifted to memorial sites. So thank you, Sarah. I know that's not a spot on answer. No, that was really helpful. I've got my brain thinking in other ways. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> We've got a question from Mary McCoy. I don't know the answer, Mary. I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. I don't, I know of Dave Chappelle's monologue, but I don't, I can't say anything about it other than I've, I've seen it. So I wish I had something smart to say, but I really don't. <laughs> and Rob, did you want to go ahead? Sure. Thanks. Hey, Dave. Great to see you. Um, a uh, great project. Um, I appreciate learning about the different aspects of this project as I hear you speak on it at different times. Um, and it's great to hear it grow and expand in important ways. Um, I had a question about the values um, that uh, drive your scholarship on this project. And what I mean is that one of the values that you seemed to emphasize today is the idea of um, accuracy and or fidelity. So you said a number of times in your presentation, this may seem like an academic point, but, or um, it's difficult uh, for even someone as knowledgeable as uh, one of your colleagues uh, who shared the photo to know which of these sites was the gas station and which was the store. Um, so I guess, you know, is that the case? Is fidelity um, an important value that's driving this project? Um, and in either case, what would be some of the other values that are driving your scholarship as you work on this project? Thank you, Rob. Great to see you too. And good questions. And it's funny you pick on fidelity because I've never thought of that as a particular high value for me, or at least it's not a it's not an ultimate value. And so I'm sure Aristotle has a good term for this, but it's one of those things that's like essential and you have to have it, but that's not the end game, right? And the reason it's not the end game, and I mean, I think of even of the story of Glendora when at the very end I was weighing in on whether or not the body was dropped in that particular river from that particular bridge. And I said, maybe it was, but I don't really, but my point there, uh, is like I care about something more than I care about fidelity. I care about use value. I care about and two two values that come to mind. I just want to throw them out there. Uh, one would be justice, and the other would be repair. Um, that that the stories I tell do justice to the people most intimately involved, and that they start to do the work of repairing the harms of white supremacy. Um, but I've been taking the task on a couple different occasions for what some of my colleagues perceive as a flippant relationship to truth. Um, and it's never personally felt flippant. It's always just felt like I care about these other values more than getting the story right. Um, but getting the story right was a huge hurdle and it took a long time, a long, um, part of trust building with the Till family. Um, and I will tell you that to Reverend Wheeler Parker and Dr. Marvell Parker in Chicago, the last living eyewitnesses to the event, 
And nothing, nothing, nothing is more important than the truth, especially as it bears on what happened at Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market. And so I have gone round and round with them on descriptions, on my storytelling, when I think I have a perfectly good story and a perfectly faithful edition that they do not think, and I've just worked with them. I mean, this is their story. And so I'm happy to tell the version of the story that they want told. Um, and so I'm careful to do that. Um, but there's even a, a better story than that. So one of, um, I don't know, one of the anxieties of memory makers is that the act of monument creation could actually like work counterproductively. And like, and what I mean is by like creating a monument or a memorial by putting Till's story online or on a smartphone app, am I not like sort of making it possible for someone to say, oh, well, Dave put the story online, I don't need to tend to it anymore, right? That That's an anxiety that's haunted me for several years. And so when we first dreamed up the Emmett Till Memory Project, we, uh, we never aimed just for putting it online. We were always thinking about how can we tell the story in such a way that it will provoke people to be engaged with it? And our basic idea is that we calibrated the story to someone's location using GPS technology. We calibrated the story to a user's location in the Delta. So if a user was standing at the courthouse, they'd get the jury's version of the story. If they were standing where the Black, Black, sorry, Black Press Lodge, they would get that version of the story. And as they moved through around the Delta, the story would shift and our, our hope was that as the user moved, the story shift, and as the story shifts, people would be forced to engage it and like think about it critically. And you know, once that happens, we can rest easy. So we pitched that. I think this is this is summer 2016. We pitched that idea to the National Endowment for the Humanities. They came back to us in December of 2016. And remember that month. Remember what's going on. And when the NEH got back with me, they said, there is no way we are funding, they, sorry, they said in a fake news world, there is no way we are going to fund something that destabilizes the story of Emmett Till. We want to fund something that nails down the story of Emmett Till because in, here the NEH was operating from the assumption that certainty Fidelity and a settled story were the best ingredients to secure commemoration, whereas I was working from the assumption that an unsettled story, simply by being unsettled, and not that, not that any of it was false, like all the stories were true, but by being unsettled, I was hoping I could do better commemorative work. Um, and we never worked through that impasse. We tried with the NEH again, and they said no again. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll stop there. but. Uh, I've thought a lot about fidelity, truthfulness. I've also thought a lot about justice and a lot about repair as well. Thanks, Dave. I'd love to know if any of you have been to these places. I'd love to know how these stories resonate. I'd love to know if any of this sounds wrong to you. Um, I can jump in with a question. I have not been to these places. Um, I'll say that, but um, I wanted to ask about the signs themselves, just because I, in, in Madison right now, and I think largely or more broadly in Wisconsin, there's sort of an ongoing effort to correct some of the uh, language on the historical signage to more accurately reflect um, the, the past and sort of the, the um, like kind of whitewashed history that's represented on the signs. And so, um, and then see, I don't think there were any slides that you had that were kind of zoomed into the actual text. And I know you mentioned actually drafting some of that language. Um, so I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that, but you also mentioned 18 signs and, and um, in mm -hmm. the one town, so. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about like the actual language. Yeah. 
Uh, so I'll tell you about the sign I wrote because I can give you the best backstory on that one. And that's the bulletproof sign. Um, and you know, that's the, just so the background is that's, it stands at the site where Till's body was pulled from the water. Um, the first sign there went up in March of 08. It was stolen and thrown into a river. It was replaced. That second sign that was there, the one that replaced the stolen one, that's the one that was shot 317 times. It was replaced with a third identical sign that lasted only 32 days before it too was shot. Um, and then in summer of 2019, that third sign was taken down to make way for the bulletproof sign. Um, I'll just say that no one on the commission and no one in the family thought that a bulletproof sign was going to solve the problem, right? In, in, in some ways, it was just a bigger target, but it was donated by a big hearted sign producer in Brooklyn, New York. And um, they were also, they're like, well, this isn't going to solve the problem, but we're not going to turn down a generous donation. One of the biggest issues when we were rewriting the sign for that final sign was this. It had been fairly controversial about whether or not just to leave the bullet riddled sign up. And I actually, I'm a little bit embarrassed about this, but I have an op-ed, I'm on public record in a small Mississippi newspaper arguing that the bullet riddled sign should be left up. And I argued that because I loved the texture of it. I loved the way it very visibly and very tangibly pulled the story from 1955 into the present. It made it sort of conspicuously obvious that the story of Till's murder can't be confined to the summer of 1955. But my mind was changed in conversation with the Till family who simply said, there is no way we can leave a bullet riddled sign standing up in public because it's simply too traumatic. And it's so traumatic, it would actually re-traumatize some of the people who just came, who would stumble across it. And I heard this and I'm like, you are right. And so I changed my mind and um, working with both the family and the commit and the, and the nonprofit, we crafted the sign and, and, and you can, you can see a picture of it online, but if you can picture it, the top of the sign has, has some text in a larger font and the bottom of the sign has some text in a smaller font. That stuff on the bottom was our way. The, the stuff on the bottom tells the story of the vandalism of the sign. So up top tells the story of 1955 down low tells the story of the vandalism since 2008. And that was more or less our negotiation to try and have it both ways to kind of keep the story, to kind of texture the sign to make it palimpsest without the trauma of the bullet holes. Thanks, Dave. Um, Krista? Dave, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about how essential it is to, to remember Emmett Till and then feeling a tension of that with all the murders we don't remember and the, and the way that Emmett Till becomes, even in my classes, right? The sort of the, uh, the representative anecdote, the, the person through whom we t tell these stories. And I'm wondering, do you think about how pointing to Emmett Till allows us to also point more broadly or the ways that Emmett Till becomes this kind of solitary holder of a story that is that implicates the whole country, but people can just focus on him instead. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right on, Krista. Um, I mean, case in point, who here knows the story of Clinton Melton? He was killed a month after the Till trial in Glendora by some of the same people who killed Emmett Till. He was tried in the same courthouse with some of the same jurors, same, some of the same white men serving on both juries. Like Emmett Till, he was acquitted by an all white jury. I mean, but no one has heard of him, right? There are, there, I could tell you three other lynchings in 1955 Mississippi that, and so the point is well taken. Um, and I think it's actually imperative to not just think of Emmett Till, but to think through Emmett Till. And, and honestly, I think 
that's starting to happen. Um, I mean, those downloads of the memory project after Floyd suggests that Till is, is becoming almost like a lens through which we see history. And I have a hunch, the more that we have that lens, the more we will begin to see these other stories. And in fact, just, um, I don't know, within the last six months, NPR reached out because they wanted to do a segment on Clinton Melton. Right. And they were and they, they they did this precise work. They started with the Till story and basically said what Krista said. But we need to think through Till to the other murders and try to remember the forgotten story of Clinton Melton. So, yeah, I'm with you. It's important work that needs to be done. Um, I'm going to go to Sarah's question in the chat here, Sarah McKinnon's question in the chat, and then I see you, Sarah Vanderhagen. Um, I love, so I came up with this phrase that I, I've honestly regretted at some points, but I use I, the phrase of the ecology of memory. And in some ways, I really like that phrase um, because it captures the way that the materiality of the place, and I'll be quick here, but like literally the path of the rivers and the depth of the topsoil and the contours of the land all dramatically shaped the stories that got passed on about Emmett Till. And that's what I really tried to do in the full length version of chapter one. You guys got a little snippet of it with Sunflower County, but in the full length version, I really try and show how because part of the land has hills and other parts didn't, that the, that shaped different kinds of racism. And, and after that shaped different kinds of racism that shaped the kind of till storytelling that helped. Um, and so I won't go into that now, but the, at least in this instance, the relationship between landforms and the particular stories we think we know about till's final night are fairly pronounced and direct and documentable. Sarah Vanderhagen, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks so much for this talk. Um, and like Rob said, I've really appreciated being able to hear you talk about this project as it's unfolded and, and that story about going to the, um, going to get the binders. I've heard on a couple of other occasions and it's uh, a really compelling one, I think. Um, so my question for you is actually, uh, it's, it's about something maybe you forgot you wrote. I don't know, maybe not. Um, in the book, in a note, about your methodology, specifically about description. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I just found it so intriguing and I found it enacted in, in the book and in what you're talking about here in, the, in your talk about, um, about storytelling and things like that. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how, you know, in one of the notes you talk about how that's an underappreciated um, methodology in the humanities. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that more. What do you mean by that? And what do you think we could do to uh, enact that in our own research? Particularly those of us, a lot of graduate students here thinking about you know, embarking on their first research projects and that kind of thing. What might we think about as description, particularly as rhetoric scholars? I love it, Sarah. No one has ever asked me that question. And, and you might be the only one who's read the footnote. So thank you. I love it. And this part about description as a critical methodology, I mean, reach out to my grad students. They are so tired of me hearing me talk about this because I really do think it's essential. Um, but the, the background is, and you all know this, but when critical rhetoric emerges in the field of communication studies, it emerges simultaneous with a backlash against description. And so you can see, and I used to keep track of these and I can't be too specific off the top of my head, but you see a number of places as critical rhetoric as a methodology and as a project is being unfolded, this constant call to go beyond description, that it's not simply enough to describe a text, you have to analyze it and you have to, um, uh, there's probably a number of words that you could insert here that go after description. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to get this right off the top of my head, but Bruno Latour has an amazing line that has really shaped my thought in fairly substantial ways and shaped this book in fairly substantial ways. He says, if when you're done with description, you find yourself needing to do something else, 
you haven't been descriptive enough. And I really stick to that. Um, and it really, I mean, that is, that, that was at least at a level of like self-conscious methodology. What do I want to do with this book? And so I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, like when I was describing the erasure of Sunflower County and sort of these different forms of racism, I found that I, I couldn't just say it happened in the Delta because if I said the murder happened in the Delta, then I would have to jump to theory or I'd have to jump to analysis or I'd have to jump to something else in order to make my case that place matters, right? But instead I just kept describing. I said, okay, there's this thing called the Delta. Let's look at it. Let's look at the soil. And so I did this deep dive, so to speak, into the soil of the Delta. I learned how deep it was. I, I tracked the mythology of the soil. I tracked the, the course of the rivers. And lo and behold, I found that once I kept describing these things, I had no need to go to analysis or to theory that I could make the case just from description itself. And, and I know that that is not a universal solvent, nor is it a universal method, but I do tell my grad students as they're writing these projects to front load their stories and to front load just, in fact, their first writing assignment, they turned it in a couple of weeks ago for me, was I want them to describe their artifacts and try to not leave the plane of description. And, 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 and later on, they, they can get to all their theory, they can get to all their analysis, but I have them start with this descriptive moment, and then I try and push them to keep describing. Um, and so I appreciate I appreciate that, Sarah. Uh, it means a, it, that method actually is fairly dear to me, um, and I'm glad you noticed it. I'm grateful. All right, I want to be sensitive to time. I think we're uh, about at time and we have our next, our, our very first graduate student panel happening at, at 545. So if you want, I put this stuff in the chat, but if you want to hear more um, from Dave and your graduate student, come Friday at noon to the graduate student lunch and learn featuring Dave um, and Derek Hanley, our other keynote speaker on public humanities work and rhetorical studies. There's a link in the chat there to register. Um, also, Derek Hanley's keynote is tomorrow at 3 Central, which is titled um, Hemmed in Race, Place, and Resistance in the City. I won't read the whole abstract, but it will discuss the rhetorical history of African Americans' responses to restrictive housing covenants and to urban renewal policies in the early to mid 20th century, um, which I'm really excited about. I have put a registration link in the chat for that as well. Um, and yeah, we have eight panels from uh, 27 graduate presenters over the next couple of days um, and from 15 institutions. Uh, and the next, the very first one starts in 10 minutes. The, there's two Zoom rooms for the conference, um, Zoom room A and Zoom room B. And uh, at 545 in Zoom room A, we have intersectional lenses to space and place. And then in Zoom room B, we have race rhetorics and critical examinations of whiteness. So I really hope to see Lots of folks there. I'm really excited to hear um, the scholarship that you're all bringing to the table for those of you that are presenting. And again, just thank you all for coming. And thank you so much, Dave. It was great. Yay. All right. I have to pop over to the um, Zoom room A to get that set up. But, and Ilea, are you all good to yeah. set up Zoom room B? Yeah, okay. I'm fine. If there's an issue like with me not being co host or something, I'll uh, shoot you a quick email. Okay. And Dave, um, if you want to stay and hang out for a couple of minutes, um, looks like a couple people here are here to maybe to talk to you a little bit more. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. I yeah. can, make, I'll make you co host. Okay. I'll, I'll thank, make you the host. Thanks for all it's your safe. work, Amanda. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate it. Yeah. Dave. Hey, bud. I'm, say, I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm not buying the description thing. Talk to me about it. 
I don't know. Like, if I, you, are, 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 I, I think maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but but you're not saying that our rhetorical critics shouldn't analyze texts, are you? No, I'm trying to to slow down the enthusiasm with which some critics jump, <clears throat> excuse me, jump to theory as an explanation of what's going on when perhaps a more powerful explanation <coughs> can be um, obtained by sticking a little closer to the ground. All right, I, 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 I'd like to hear more about that. I, again, I wish we were, we had an opportunity to share a, a drink now and, and talk uh, more, but, um, but I'd like to hear more about it because I do think, um, I, I agree with you that uh, what you just said now makes a lot of sense to me about the rush to theory as an explanation. So now we take a, a theoretical term and say it's this, and that's the analysis that makes a lot of sense to me. 